Here are my top eight stocks to buy right now. In this video, we'll alternate going over one stock that I already own, followed by one new stock to keep it interesting. As we work our way up to a stock that's increased in price by 181% over the past year, that may have the potential to double again. And as always, I'll share every stock trade that I made this month at the end of the video. And to show that I put my money where my mouth is, here's my actual Charles Schwab portfolio. We can see that over the past one year, it's increased by 61% or 72 thousand dollars in total and it hasn't been a smooth ride it's gone up it's gone down again before shooting up before seeing dramatic drops again this is just kind of par for the course when you're investing in high growth tech stocks that tend to be more volatile than the overall market higher risk but higher potential reward which leads us to my first stock sofi here's sofi in my actual portfolio i own 2100 shares in the stock at a value of sixteen thousand dollars and in total i've made around two thousand dollars in the company now charles schwab gives these stocks a rating as far as i can tell this is sort of a valuation-based rating, but I don't put a ton of stock in this because I've had stocks like one you'll see later in this video that have made me a 400% return while having a D or F rating from Charles Schwab the entire time. SoFi is a fintech stock whose number of members has been absolutely exploding over the last several years while making adjusted EBITDA of $98 million, which is basically just a fancy word for profit. SoFi is a really interesting company because they basically operate like three companies in one. You have their financial services segment, which includes things like the SoFi checking and savings account, the SoFi credit card, and SoFi Invest, their investing app. This is how they capture new customers, which they then upsell into more valuable areas of the company, like their lending segment, the second part of their business. Before the student loan pause in 2020, SoFi was the largest private student loan provider in the United States. Then when their business got basically shut down overnight because no one refinances a loan when they're getting a 0% interest rate from the federal government. Luckily, SoFi had a secret weapon. SoFi C CEO Anthony Noto, who managed to turn the company from a massive student loan lender into a personal loan lender, basically at the drop of a hat, saving SoFi's business. SoFi now actually holds more personal loans than they do student loans. And then there's the third area of SoFi's business, their technology platform. This is the technological backbone that underlies all of SoFi's business. It allows them to do things like offering their own credit card or offering their own savings account, while offering better rates than the competition because they're more efficient in how they run the business. In fact, they're so efficient that other companies like SoFi's competitor, Robinhood, actually run on SoFi's underlying technology platform. So here's why I'm investing in SoFi going forward. Because SoFi had this giant hole scooped out of their business from student loans, and then they filled that in with personal loans, as student loans start to come back into full force and the student loan pauses are ended, all of those additional student loans basically get piled on top as just extra profit for SoFi. And that's in the one to two year time horizon. In the even longer term, SoFi's technology platform could help them build themselves into the AWS of fintech. Similar to how Amazon launched their own technology platform that ran both their website, but now runs basically most of the internet on top of it, SoFi can build the tech platform that the entire fintech ecosystem runs on top of. Imagine no longer needing to wait three to five business days to send money. SoFi's goal is to be an extremely consumer focused company and make products that make financial services easier easier for everyday people. And based on the very high growth rate we're seeing in this company with their number of products sold increasing 45% year over year, it seems like SoFi is delivering on this goal. Which leads us to another FinTech stock, which I guarantee you've heard of, but I've never talked about before on this channel. That company is PayPal. Now you might think that PayPal is kind of a boring company. What do you do with them? You just send money to each other. But this $70 billion FinTech stock is working to remake itself as the growth stock in its industry. Let me explain. PayPal is not a new company. They were originally founded way back in 1998. And after a couple acquisitions and then breakups, including a period in 2000 when they merged with the original X.com founded by Elon Musk, PayPal has emerged as one of the tech companies that have proven they can survive the decades, even periods like the dot-com bubble. And you can see the siege for this success in PayPal's early years. PayPal was founded by basically Silicon Valley royalty, including investors like Peter Thiel, who went on to become one of the biggest investors in Facebook, as well, of course, as having Elon Musk as its CEO for a period. But more recently, PayPal stock has floundered. Over the past five years, it saw a rise in 2021, but it's down 30% over that period. And over the last year, it's just dropped 16%. Even while the broader stock market has seen a rise of 21.5% over that same period. So why then am I listing this company, which isn't really known for its innovation and hasn't really seen much happening in its stock price for years, 
Cruise as a potential growth stock for 2024. Well, PayPal has now laid the groundwork for what could completely turn the company around over the next few years. And it all starts with their new CEO. Alex Chris is PayPal's brand new CEO who just recently led their most recent earnings call. He has a background of nearly two decades working for Intuit, which is the parent company of services like TurboTax, QuickBooks, and Credit Karma. And even though he's a relatively new CEO, he has a really big vision for PayPal's future. Some of his first words on their most recent earnings call was saying that he is someone who speaks plainly and transparently, and that if there are things they can do better to fix, he will have no hesitation in calling those out. And he does call them out. He notes how while the company has been focusing on innovation, their competition and complexity has increased over the years, and the company's focus hasn't been clear at all. Some of you may know that PayPal was actually acquired by eBay a few years ago, but then in 2014, eBay spun them off into a separate company. And since then, PayPal's been focused a lot on just acquiring different companies. In 2015, they acquired the Zoom Corporation. In 2018, they acquired a Swedish payment processor. And reportedly, they've even considered acquiring Pinterest. The company clearly has a lot of money and they have a core base of users that like to use them, but it seems like their strategy has been a bit all over the place recently. If we believe this new CEO, his whole role is to come in and re-energize the company, give it vision that it can actually pursue and take the company's fantastic talent and tons of resources and actually point them in an effective direction. He basically breaks out the market into three main areas. First, focusing on consumers through things like PayPal's Venmo app, which is now so ubiquitous that Venmoing someone has become a verb. The next segment he wants to focus on is small businesses. And he has a lot of experience in this area, having been an executive at Intuit focused on their small business segment. His goal here is to differentiate PayPal. What makes them different from every other payment processor out there? And how can they make services more valuable to those small businesses? Lastly, they're gonna focus on large enterprise customers, people who care about security in their transactions and efficiency. And by addressing each of these three areas and focusing purely on how they can deliver value to each of them, the new CEO thinks he can turn PayPal from kind of a boring old fintech stock into a major growth hub for the future. And I think he's pretty serious just based on how many times he used the word growth in his earnings call. Now that's all a nice story, but ultimately we'll have to see if the numbers end up supporting that story. Currently, if we look at PayPal as a company, their revenue growth rate hasn't been anything special. They've seen 8% growth in the most recent quarter, a quarter before that 7%, 8.5%, and then 6.7%, which puts them far outside the realm of a high growth company like say Sofa. So ultimately it comes down to this. Can the CEO effectively turn the ship around and revitalize this aging fintech stock? Or is PayPal going to continue to slip before it's eventually passed up by new competitors in the market? We'll have to wait and see, but regardless, this will be an interesting stock to watch. But next up, we have the fastest growing company that I invest in, in an area that's become one of my biggest investing trends of the past year, data and AI. And I actually wrote a comprehensive deep dive into this company in my latest post in FinTech Circle. FinTech Circle is my private investing community where I post every single stock trade that I make in real time, do weekly breakdowns of stocks voted on by the community, including companies that I may invest in in the future, like this breakdown I did of PayPal. You also get access to my weekly in the known newsletter where I basically give a brain dump of every important thing that's happening this next week in the market. So you don't have to waste your time watching a long news report. You can get all the information in about 30 seconds. And that's not to mention the weekly live events like the live stock breakdown where you can jump on a call with me and ask questions as we go through analyzing a stock together, as well as a Q and A session where I will answer your direct questions about investing, building wealth, or really anything you want to talk about. Plus, when you sign up, you get access to all these other great perks like exclusive events, free stock training courses, and most importantly of all, a community of like-minded investors who are all trying to build wealth together. It makes you a more effective investor and it saves you a ton of time looking at companies that maybe someone else has already looked into. You can sign up for FinTech Circle using the link in the description. This is basically like my version of a Patreon, but I wanted to give way more value than you get on any typical Patreon. So check that out using the link in the description and and now let's move on to the fastest growing stock in my portfolio, Snowflake. Snowflake is fundamentally a data company. They make it easier for companies to store and use their data without hiring expensive engineers to do all the work for them. I currently own 60 shares of Snowflake valued at around $11,500. And I did reduce my position in this company slightly a few months ago. And so currently this is showing a loss of $2,500. Now that number is a little bit skewed because of the way Charles Schwab calculates gains and losses is on a first in, first out basis. 
analysts. So if I bought more expensive shares later, those are going to show up as a loss currently. But here's why I think Snowflake still has massive potential in the future. Even after the stock has already risen 33% over the past year to a current market cap of $63 billion. So for anyone who's not a data and AI nerd, let me give you the 20 second summary of why Snowflake matters. A hundred years ago, you might've kept track of your data in a physical ledger that you wrote stuff down in. Then 50 years ago, you might've used a simple database and seen a 10X improvement in how much data you could store and how efficiently you could keep track of it. Then when easy to use visual tools like Microsoft Excel came out, that was another 10X improvement. Then we saw the cloud, then data warehousing, data lakes. Every improvement in database and data storing technology sees a 10X improvement on how we can use that data. Snowflake is inventing the next order of magnitude improvement, what they call the data cloud. This is a platform that allows companies to manage incredibly complex data without having to hire an entire data team to manage it for them. This is useful for feeding into their applications, for developing AI and machine learning applications. They even have the ability to share data with other companies along what they call data edges. So imagine you're a pharmaceutical company collaborating with some other companies on developing a new medicine. You can share data using Snowflake with those other companies. This also makes Snowflake incredibly sticky because you're not gonna switch to a different platform and lose access to all that data that you were sharing with the other businesses. Snowflake made just over $700 million in revenue in their most recent quarter, up 32% year over year. And while they are not yet profitable from a gap accounting perspective, they do have a 78% non-gap gross product margin, meaning for every dollar their product brings in, they're able to keep 78% of that before accounting for things like operations and HR. And perhaps more importantly, the company is now free cash flow positive, and they have been for well over a year, with the company bringing in $111 million in cash in their most recent quarter. And as Warren Buffett will tell you, in an economic downturn, cash is king. As long as the company is producing cash, it's never going to go bankrupt. And they can use that cash for things like acquiring competitors launching new products, or even buying back the stock price if it dips too low. Snowflake also has a 135% net revenue retention rate, meaning for every dollar a customer spends this year, they can expect them to spend $1.35 next year. That's basically built-in growth to the platform that they see even if they don't go out and acquire any new customers. And as they start to focus on more and more large customers, they now have 436 customers who spend over a million dollars a year with them, they should start to see some more stabilization in their business and hopefully a little bit less volatility. Because if Snowflake is one thing, they are very, very volatile in their stock price. That being said, I'm going to be investing in the company because while they are still expensive based on their relative size to other companies in the industry, the company has always been expensive. In fact, if we look at their valuation as measured by their price to sales ratio, Snowflake's current price actually puts it at one of the lowest valuations it's ever seen in its history as a company. And even if that price to sales ratio stays exactly where it is, 24. As Snowflake's revenue grows over time, that should, in theory, cause the stock price to rise as well. Which leads us to our next stock, where we're going to step outside the world of software and into a company that has reshaped the very fabric of technology twice, and they're doing it again. And by the way, I just wanted to say thank you so much for getting us to 50,000 subscribers. The channel's growing really quickly, and I really appreciate all your support. And if you wanna help us get to our goal of 100,000 subscribers this year, maybe consider clicking the button below. So the next stock on the list is NVIDIA, which I think anybody will agree is one of the most important tech companies of our time. NVIDIA is fundamentally a chip maker, but that kind of oversimplifies what they actually do. If you think of how a traditional computer works, it runs primarily on what's known as a CPU or central processing unit. This is basically a chip that can do a bunch of calculations really quickly in a row. But Nvidia does something a little bit different. They build GPUs or graphical processing units. These were originally designed for basic 3D applications like video games. And it's from this innocuous use case of a primarily video game focused company that the behemoth that is Nvidia came to be what it is today. Nvidia's stock price has risen an insane 13 1,500% over the past five years, with a 233% rise in just the last year. That means that if you had invested $100 with NVIDIA, you would now have $333, which is also why the company currently has a market cap of $1.47 trillion, meaning they basically added a trillion dollars to their value just in the last year. Now that might sound kind of crazy, especially when you consider that means the company is worth more than Netflix and Facebook combined, but NVIDIA's 
possibly one of the best strategically positioned tech companies in the entire world. And potentially one of the few hardware companies that could maybe one day catch up with a company like Apple. If you think back to around five years ago, what was the hype at the time? Well, one of the big hypes was cryptocurrency, which Nvidia was perfectly positioned to offer a solution for. Because it turns out running a bunch of small calculations in parallel, which can be used for updating pixels on a screen, can also be used for solving crypto hashes. And if we look at the interest in Bitcoin over time, we can see how it kind of peaked back in 2021, had a little peak in 2022, and then it's died off a little bit since then. So did Nvidia die off with the crypto hype? No, because there was another tech trend which they were then able to jump onto instead, the metaverse trend. Metaverse is obviously going to use GPUs. It's basically like a video game. And we can see that right as crypto was starting to trail off, metaverse ended up popping up instead. And Nvidia is a huge player in the metaverse. The company's now expanding from just building the hardware that software runs on to also building software that's optimized specifically for their GPUs, meaning companies that want to build the best of the best metaverse products can do so using Nvidia's software to speed up their development. But if you look around, metaverse hasn't really hit us in a full wave yet, and that trend's kind of died down for the time being. So did Nvidia die off with them? No, because there was another tech trend coming which Nvidia rode just like the ones before. And this one makes the other two pale in comparison. The trend of AI. If we look up AI over the years, that little blip back there in 2021 is metaverse, and that tiny gap before that is blockchain. Here is the interest in AI over the past several years. It's not even close. And it turns out once again that Nvidia's chips are just better at running AI processing than almost any other company out there. And Nvidia is no stranger to this space. Back in the summer of 2020, Elon Musk discussed Tesla's need for high-powered Nvidia chips for Tesla's self-driving capabilities, saying that we're using a lot of Nvidia hardware. Companies like Google, which are at the forefront of AI, have been expanding their partnership with Nvidia to offer more advanced AI computing services. All these companies that are focused on building the next AI revolution are depending on Nvidia's chips to train the large language models and new machine learning models that will power that revolution. And with the company so well strategically positioned at this point, the only reason that they haven't grown their revenue more than the $18 billion they did in their most recent quarter, up 200% year over year, is because of how long it takes them to create new GPUs. There is way more demand for Nvidia's tech than they can even produce right now. And it's been like that for a while. Also, while we're on this note, the company's net income, which is basically their profit, increased 1300% in the last one year. And so for anyone who thinks the company is now too expensive, their PE ratio is about a quarter of what it was a year ago. But next, we have a company that basically single-handedly invented a new market in one of the fastest growing industries on earth, cybersecurity. Pause, before we get to that, I want to go over this video sponsored stock overview presented by Sideways Frequency. That stock is Nexus Uranium Corp, ticker symbol OTCGIDMN, a small over-the-counter stock which focuses on uranium mining in the US. With a global effort to reach net zero carbon emissions, nuclear power may be one of the main sources to replace energy from sources such as coal and natural gas. Nexus Uranium believes that if there is a dramatic rise in uranium demand, they can be well positioned to capitalize. The US currently relies on Russian imported uranium for a proportion of their reactor needs. And there has been legislation put forward in the past to restrict this. The company reported that the metal was the best performing energy commodity of 2023, with prices up 125% since 2020. Nexus Uranium is focused on a US based uranium site. In October 2023, the company reportedly announced an option to acquire 90% of the Ray Mesa uranium project in Utah. The company engages in acquisition, exploration, and development of uranium and vanadium, gold, and other mineral resource properties. And they also report that they have a portfolio of gold, including 51% ownership in the Independence Project in Nevada. Utah is the third largest uranium producing state in the US, having a cumulative production of about 130 million pounds of uranium oxide. Now, production came to a halt in the early 1990s due to low prices, but a resurgence in the market may bring a new period of exploration and production to Utah. So thank you to Sideways Frequency for sponsoring that stock overview. And now let's look at a company that is outgrowing its competitors in one of the biggest investing trends of the next decade. This next company I've owned for a while, and they are a leader in an emerging space that is becoming more and more important as we see a renewed focus on cybersecurity and the cloud. And that company is Zscaler. Zscaler offers a zero trust solution. So when you think of traditional security, think back to how you 
kept out the bad guys from your castle in the 1500s? Well, you'd probably build a wall around your castle and then a moat around that to keep the bad guys out. But what happens if the bad guys get inside? Well, your castle is basically lost. And that's basically how cybersecurity worked for a long time. Zscaler focuses on zero trust security, meaning every application, every person, every computer on the network has to authenticate anytime it wants to talk to another one. It doesn't really matter how the specifics of this work, but the most important thing is that this is the way that cybersecurity is going as more and more companies move into the cloud. And this is part of the reason why this company made nearly half a billion dollars in revenue in their most recent quarter, up nearly 40% year over year. And they've maintained that growth rate for several quarters. Last quarter, they were up 43, before that 46, and before that 51%. And while the company is not yet net income positive, meaning they're not gap profitable, the company has gotten closer to it over the past year, and they will hit profitability in the near future. So you have a company that's positioned well as the cloud grows and as cybersecurity grows, that's also growing faster than the market, seems like a no brainer to invest, which is why I own 82 shares of this company at a value of just under $19,000. Next up, I have another stock that I don't yet own, but is probably one of my most requested stocks to cover on this channel. And let me just say, this company has a wild story. So earlier when I was talking about PayPal, I mentioned this guy, Peter Thiel. Yeah, that guy sitting next to Elon Musk. He realized after working at PayPal for a while that all the security and fraud prevention they were building into PayPal could be applied to other industries as well, especially high security, high sensitivity industries. And the company he put together to take advantage of this was called Palantir. Palantir might be one of the most secretive companies on earth because they've done a lot of work with the US State Department and the US military. In fact, the US government used Palantir to help convict Bernie Madoff in the largest Ponzi scheme of all time. So Palantir has their three main platforms. They have Foundry where they basically have built the operating system that companies can run their data on top of. You have Gotham, which they call their operating system for making decisions, allowing companies to realize insets from extremely complex data sets. And you had Apollo letting you update and deploy new applications even if you're in the middle of a battlefield thousands of miles from your home base. Now a few years ago, I actually covered Palantir on this channel and at the time I decided not to invest in them because while they have really good technology, they aren't able to deploy it in the same way that Snowflake can, where a developer can basically sign up for a free account and then Snowflake can land and expand them. Palantir almost operates like a software consulting firm where they send in a bunch of expensive engineers to analyze all your systems and then build a somewhat bespoke solution for you. Because of this, I worried about their ability to scale. And it turns out that over that time period, their stock price dropped fairly substantially. But in mid 2023, their stock price started rising again. And I think that one of the reasons for this may be their newest technology, AIP. AIP is designed around what they call activating a full spectrum of AI in days, basically using new advances in AI, like generative AI. They're able to streamline the process of extracting insights from companies' data. Imagine ChatGPT that's plugged directly into your organization's data. This could potentially unblock one of Palantir's biggest limitations in that they need hundreds of really expensive engineers to scale, and it's just hard to find good engineering talent. That being said, this company is far from a growth stock at this point. Their revenue is currently just over half a billion dollars, but they're only growing at 17% year over year. And a few years ago, when I was first analyzing this company, their CEO, Alex Karp, who side note is a really interesting character who you should definitely look into at some point, let's just say he likes the limelight, promised investors in Palantir that they would see an acceleration in growth over the coming years as companies realize the value that Palantir provided. At the time, the company was growing at around 30% year over year, and we've obviously seen their growth rate continue to drop from there. And so while this company could have massive potential to grow in their stock price, I personally won't be investing in them because I fundamentally just don't trust the company's leadership. I think their CEO tends to hype up the stock price more than the stock itself, and he said some misleading things in the past, which if you've seen my financial red flags framework is one of the reasons that I would avoid investing in a company. But next up, we have a company that I did invest in, which is actually made me a 400% return between the two different times that I invested in the company. But this company still seems like it's in the early innings compared to the massive opportunity that's in front of them. That company is CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike is an AI powered cybersecurity company. This company gained a ton of attention back in 2021 when they stopped the largest then hack of all time, the SolarWinds hack, which affected companies ranging from Microsoft to the US Department of Defense. But guess who wasn't affected? 
CrowdStrike's customers. CrowdStrike's AI-powered protection basically monitors all the traffic that goes in and out of different websites, which is the same thing traditional security does. Only, while traditional security basically looks at every other hack that's ever happened and tries to see, hmm, does this traffic look like a previous hack? CrowdStrike is able to train an AI model to proactively recognize attackers in unique ways that we've never seen before. And as we're seeing more and more automation of cybersecurity attacks through things like generative AI, the only way to fight this increase in attacks is to use AI on the defensive as well. And boy is CrowdStrike doing this. Their stock price has increased an insane 180% over the last year with a nearly 20% increase just in the month of January, bringing them to a current market cap of just under $70 billion while making $786 million in revenue in their most recent quarter, up 35% year over year, and getting close to their first year of being profitable in every single quarter, with their profitability increasing to 26 million, up 150% year over year. This is a stock that I owned a few years ago, made a 300% return, sold out for a while, and then bought back in early in 2023. And it's a company that I plan to own for the near future. CrowdStrike is currently the largest position in my portfolio, and stick around to see all my stock trades over the past month, but I currently own 100 shares in this company worth $29,000, and that is more than double the initial 13500 I put in, with a $15,000 gain since I invested in this company. And by the way, there's Charles Schwab saying this has had a D rating the entire time that I've held it. But for the last company, which I don't yet own, we'll be shifting gears from these smaller growth stock type of companies to a company you've definitely heard of, but you may not have considered as an innovation company before now. Apple. Now, when you hear the name Apple, you probably just think, oh, one of the biggest companies in the world that probably doesn't move that quickly. And yeah, they make good products, but you know, they're kind of pedestrian. Well, I thought that too, until I looked deeper at the company's actual strategy. The company's current market cap is sitting just under $3 trillion, meaning the 30% rise that they've seen in the last year has increased their market cap by over $1 trillion in one year. Here's the thing about Apple. They're probably never going to be the first company to launch a new product. They like to wait until a certain market is mature enough that they can then come out with a product which just works for consumers. But the thing is, when they launch that product, that product category suddenly becomes legitimized. Think the first iPhone. There were touchscreens before that, but the iPhone launched the smartphone category. Or with tablets, or with AirPods. Or how about the newest product category, the new Apple Vision Pro, which if it follows the same pattern that we've seen from all of Apple's products over the last 15 years, could issue in a new era of spatial computing and actually make augmented reality a reality for everyday users and not just for niche industry use cases. Now, is this company going to double in price over a single year? No, but this is a relatively stable investment, which I think I can rely on investing in for a consistent return over time. I just don't see a world where Apple doesn't continue to make great products and they don't continue to expand their line of products into the latest and greatest in tech. And lastly, I promise to show you all of my stock trades over the past month. So here they are in the FinTech investing group, along with a written explanation for each of them. But I bought 250 additional shares in SoFi on January 3rd. And then the last trade before that was when I completely sold out of Sentinel-1. And here's a list of every single stock that I currently own in my portfolio, also in that group. I tend to trade in flurries when earnings come out and don't do a lot in the meantime. So expect to see a lot more trades coming out from me over the next couple months. And if you wanna be the first to hear about those, sign up for FinTech Circle using the link in the description. And now go ahead and check out another video and maybe subscribe to help us reach 100,000 subscribers this year. We'll see you next time.